How many of you enjoy stories from ancient Greece and India? Can we have a show of hands? Lovely, I think I see quite a few in the audience. Well, it's not for nothing that uh, stories like uh, Percy Jackson or movies like Avatar are so captivating to many people. Turns out that the stories of uh, powerful gods and the ferocious demons that they battled and the lovely divine maidens that they either loved or tormented are captivating to most people. In these stories, we are transported to ancient magical times when the cadence of the story allows us to go to a realm of magic where we enjoy some of these stories. To most people, these stories are just that. These are silly myths that are based on the unrestrained imagination of ancient people who didn't know science better. However, such an infantilizing of the ancients prevents us from understanding the science which they brilliantly encoded in some of their stories. So let me tell you stories. Let me tell you stories from ancient Greece and from ancient India. Let us get astounded at the powerful and the departure, at the outrageous departure from rationality that these stories encoded. And also, let me show you the keys to unlocking the message in these stories. And let us get astounded at some of the powerful math and astronomy that the ancients brilliantly encoded in these stories. So before I go there, we need to remember there was a time when literacy rates were so low that only a chosen elite could read and write. So this meant most learning had to be passed on orally. This also meant that the human mind craves entertainment. So the ancients, what they did is, they brilliantly chose a bedrock of an entertaining story in which they could embed their observational wisdom. So with this observational wisdom, they could create a capsule that people could learn and understand, and it is so powerful that even today we are here listening to stories and understand the message in these stories. So truly an outstanding innovation by the ancients that they could make learning so painless across these centuries. So let me first start with the Greek story of the Pleiades. So who were the Pleiades? And the Pleiades were the virginal companions of the goddess Artemis. And who was Artemis? Artemis was the goddess of hunt and she was a protector of virgins. So one day, the great hunter, Orion, spied the Pleiades at play and becoming enamored with them, he started pursuing them. The sisters, the Pleiades, fled in great distress to avoid his unwanted advances. However, a doggedly resolute Orion continued to chase them. Now, obviously, Artemis was the protector of the virgins, was highly perturbed, and she went to God Zeus and pleaded with him, please save the Pleiades. And the God Zeus did intervene. He transformed the sisters into doves who flew out of the reach of Orion. However, Artemis was still furious at the transgressions of Orion. How could he do that? So she had him killed with a scorpion. Well, the story doesn't end there. Zeus immortalized both Orion and the Pleiades as stars in the sky. I know that at a time when we study the birth, the death, and the dynamics of stars using powerful astrophysics and mathematics, it's difficult not to smile at such a story of stellar formation. However, the ancients had intended to communicate two pieces of information in this in the story. The first is the relative position of Pleiades and Orion in the night sky. Orion and Pleiades are constellations that appear in the winter night sky in the northern hemisphere. So in the winter months, which is around now, after sundown, if you look to the east, you first see the Pleiades rise in the, in the east, and a short while later, you see Orion rise in the east, behind Pleiades, and the two constellations sail in unison in the night sky, as if Orion continues to chase the Pleiades forever in perpetuity. So you see how easy it is to remember. Anybody who remembers the story has only to first 
look up and spot the very giant Orion constellations, very familiar and easily recognizable. You spot Orion, you look a little ahead of Orion and you spot uh, Pleiades over there. So even if you knew nothing about the night sky, it is so easy for you to uh, recognize these constellations. Now, there is a second piece of information hiding in the story, and that is the death of Orion by a scorpion. This simple statement says that even as Scorpio, the constellation Scorpio rises in the east, Orion just begins to set in the west. So here setting, dying is used as an allegory for setting. So the ascendancy of, uh, of Scorpio, which is the rising of Scorpio, advancement of Scorpio, results in the dying of Orion. So once again, it's so easy to locate these constellations in the sky even if you did not know anything about these, if you located Orion setting in the west, you look due east, and there you are. You see a Scorpio over there. Very powerful mnemonics, a very powerful way the ancients encoded information. So I hope that that has set the stage for trying to uh, see how the ancients encoded observational wisdom into their stories. So with that, let me take you halfway across the world. Let me take you to ancient India and to the present times in India, where I'd like to talk to you about a living tradition, a living tradition that is there even today, going back in an unconnected, unbroken chain to almost 8,000 years. This is a tradition where newly wed Indian couples are prompted to come out and look at the binary star pair called Vashishta Arundhati in the night sky as a measure of auspiciousness. So, Vashishta Arundhati is better known by its recent Arabic name, Mizar al Khor. So, uh, Vashishta Arundhati are part of the constellation that is known in ancient Indian languages as uh, Saptarishi. In Western world, we call them the Big Dipper or Arsa Major or the Great Bear and so on. So, it is a, uh, Vashishta was a Rishi who lived in ancient India. What is a Rishi? A Rishi is a very, very wise man very enlightened and understanding the nature of reality. So he lived in a hermitage with his wife, Arundhati, who's revered even today as an epitome of chastity and virtue. Of all the visible binary stars in the sky, the ancients selected Vashishta Arundhati as auspicious. And let me tell you the fascinating reason why this is so. So it, it turns out that from our studies today of all the visible binary stars, we know that the great majority of them are such that the larger star gravitationally holds a smaller orbiting companion, and the smaller companion goes around the larger star. However, we know that this is not the case for Arundhati Vashishta. In Arundhati Vashishta, they are gravitationally bound in the sense that Vashishta goes around Arundhati, while Arundhati goes around Vashishta. In other words, they co-orbit each other. So the ancient Indians who had observed this phenomena had called this out as an exemplar of what an ideal married relationship should be. And so they wove this into a tradition that for over 8,000 years, newlywed couples are prompted to look at that and internalize a message of how to conduct themselves in a relationship. We know the age of some of these stories because even today we can use archaeo astronomical facts and we can try to figure out when these uh, stories might have been true. So from that, I'd like to take you to, uh, to a very magical time, again in India, a magical time when the moon married the 27 daughters of King Daksha. Well, if you're the moon and you lived in those times, you could get away with polygamy, but don't try it today. <laughs> So the story goes that each day, the moon would visit one of his wives. However, his father-in-law, King Daksha, got word that the moon favors one of his wives called Rohini much more than the other wives. And he was furious with his son-in-law. How could he treat his daughters not equally? So he was furious with him. And so he cursed his uh, uh, son-in-law 
but then the moon uh, managed to go and plead with uh, the god uh, Mahadeva and he got a boon from him and as a result of which he was condemned to a life of waxing and waning. Now this enchanting story has encoded both complex as well as uh, uh, simple astronomical facts. Let me explain. The ancient Indians had observed that each day the moon rises in the east at a different time and therefore against a different backdrop of the skies and stars. They also observed that it took approximately 27 days for the moon to return to the same backdrop of the sky and stars. So they decided to divide the 360 degree sphere into 27 sections. Now it's not enough to just divide it into sections. You also need to be able to recognize these sections. So what they did is they decided to, uh, uh, they looked for the brightest stars in each of these sections and they named each of those stars for one of the wives of the moons. These were the nakshatras. Nakshatras are loosely translated as the lunar mansions. So the 27 nakshatra model is exactly that. So see, this is a very, very powerful mnemonic that the ancients evolved, where using the mnemonics of the moon's wife's name, they could come out and look at the night sky and recognize the principal stars in it, as well as associate them with the phases of the moon and thus mark the passage of time. This mechanism of passage of time has been used in India for an exceedingly long period of time, even to present times when you mark the occurrence of festivals using such a lunar calendar. So uh, we are no closer to addressing the story of why did the moon favor Rohini? And I'd like to come to that. The ancients had observed that in its path over the ecliptic, the ecliptic is the imaginary line from the east to the west across which celestial bodies like the moon, the sun, and the constellations go. They had noticed that when the moon goes across the ecliptic, sometimes it covers a principal star, and sometimes it just comes close but does not cover a principal star. So there is a technical name for this. It is called a lunar occultation. The ancients had observed that this occultation sometimes happens with some principal stars and not with others, and they also observed a periodicity. They observed a periodicity of 19 years, which today we call a Maton cycle. So uh, it turns out that today with our studies, we know that if a principal star is located between four degrees and six degrees from the ecliptic, then it experiences a cluster of lunar occultations over a four year period, which repeats all over after 19 years. If the principal star is located greater than six degrees from the ecliptic, then it does not experience any occultation. I know that sounds very technical, but really speaking, these are very simple observational things that you can do. If you read a star almanac, or if you read an astronomy magazine and get to know about an impending lunar occultation, all you need to do is go out to the appointed time, look at the night sky, and you can make a naked eye observation of uh, some of this phenomena. Or if you want a closer look, literally, you could use a binocular or a telescope. Or if you're so impatient, you could use a, a planetarium software in your computer and quickly simulate this phenomena. So I did all of these things to try and understand this Indian story of why did the moon favor nakshatra Rohini over all the other nakshatras? Well, it turns out that Rohini is the star that in Arabic is called Aldebaran. So today we know them by the familiar name Aldebaran. Rohini is located at five degrees from the ecliptic. What does it mean? It means that Rohini is going to experience a cluster of occultations over a four year period that repeats all over after 19 years. Well, I counted in the latest cluster, the latest cluster is from 2015, ending this year in 2018, I counted 49 occultations of Aldebaran or Rohini with the moon. This is far greater than the number of occultations that the moon has had with any other nakshatra or principal stars. Not only had the ancients observed the phenomena of occultation, not only had they also looked at the frequency and called out how often each is occulted, they had also noticed that Rohini was occulted the most and preserved that observational wisdom in an easy to remember story of the moon and his wives and how he loved Rohini more than the others. So isn't it amazing, such a simple, uh, com complex astronomical phenomena encoded in a simple idiom that is unfortunately easily dismissed as a silly myth. So the next time that any of you hear anybody dismissing an ancient story as a myth, 
to ask them to pause and reflect, they could be spurning millennia of wisdom that is encoded in the story. Thank you for listening to my stories.